So I like to wonder. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's really a fabulous pleasure for me to uh, uh, welcome you all here to Peter Mac. Uh, this building and this project has been uh, a dozen years of my life. Uh, uh, when we, uh, we opened our um, uh, pit facility in, uh, in East Melbourne, um, uh, John Brumby was uh, the minister for everything. I called him the Hydra. He had so many hats, and I've become the Hydra myself. I've got quite a few hats if you look at the, the titles I have there. And it's, uh, it scarcely seems possible to me that it's 20 years ago that we started positron emission tomography and PRRT here in Melbourne uh, at the Peter Mac. And it's been a fantastic journey. Uh, this was our first PET scanner uh, installed in East Melbourne. And this was the very first patient who treated And it's always been uh, very personal for me because this patient was my cardiac stress nurse. She was, she was a friend and a personal uh, patient uh, uh, who became a patient because of uh, uh, being diagnosed with this uh, particular disease. And uh, it started me on a journey of this fascinating tumour called gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumours, GIPNETs. And they can arise anywhere from the lips down to your back passage and they all behave very differently. They're incredible uh, tumours. I was fascinated to learn that they can arise from 14 different cells in the body. And they all come under different names depending on the cell of origin and what particular hormones they produce. If they do, some of them produce hormones and others don't. And this is kind of confusing, you know, for you know, doctors uh, to, to understand about this disease. It's so complex. And so being human beings, we like things to be simple and we call them net, just one word, neuroendocrine tumour. But there's a whole range of diseases and they all behave very differently. The thing that really distressed me early on was how many patients were turning up with really advanced disease. I said, how bad are doctors? How crappy are they at diagnosis? But the problem is that the symptoms associated with NET are really commonplace. All of those things, I'm sure everyone in the room can see one of those diagnoses that's been applied to them, irritable bowel syndrome, asthma, menopause, anxiety, you're just a nut. Uh, yeah. So you have, and that brings a lot of anger, personal anger. Why didn't I go and get uh, information earlier? Why didn't I find out about this earlier? Why didn't I think that I might have something? Or anger to their doctors. But you have to be gentle on yourselves and, and a little bit gentle on your doctors, not too gentle, because otherwise they'll stop thinking about carcinoid. But it, it's very important uh, to recognise that this is a difficult thing to, to diagnose. I hope, I hope you'll excuse me being politically in, 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 incorrect here, but I mean this in the nicest possible way. The neuroendocrine cell is a fantastic cell. It senses its environment. It's, it's really good at, at, at knowing what's going on. It's a networker. It gets together with a whole lot of other cells, and like women, God, it can talk. <laughs> it, it uses every medium available to it. Nerve signals, chemicals, it, it's a talker. It's a talker. It even talks to the immune system that Michael just uh, told you about, the, the lymphocytes sitting there, has these uh, receptors on the, the somatostatin receptors. So they talk to one another. And just like women, they're great until they get into a big group and they all start nattering away and have a bit of alcohol and get a bit disinhibited. <laughs> And then everything gets a bit pear-shaped. And the same thing happens with neuroendocrine tumours. They get together and they pour out too much uh, hormones. Some, uh, serotonin comes out. And so instead of opening up the blood vessels to allow the nutrients to go to the liver, they open up the blood vessels everywhere and so people flush. And instead of putting a little bit of water and mucus in to lubricate the food through the bowel, it all pours in at one time and you get diarrhoea. So... Like, like any good system, you need a frontal lobe. The frontal lobe is the controlling part of the brain. You know, disinhibited behaviour needs a frontal lobe. And the frontal lobe of neuroendocrine cells is the somatostatin receptor. It's the one that turns them off, turns off their function. Uh, somatos in Greek, and I think, are there any Greeks in there that will correct me on this, but is body and status is stop. So it's the stop uh, clock of the body. And it's like a revolving door into the cell that takes messages turns off the function, stops them secreting their hormones. 
And so if the somatostatin receptor is like a revolving door, then you need keys. And the keys to those are peptides. Very important. If you have a key, you need a key ring. And they're called collating agents. And then you need the stuff that makes it really interesting. They're the dangly bits that hang off your keys. And everyone has their own personality uh, you know, uh, that, that makes a key uh, look attractive. This is relevant to what we're talking about this week uh, in Melbourne, the Theranostics, because it's putting dangly bits together with different peptides, using different dangly bits for imaging and therapy, uh, putting them together, molecular imaging, to find the target and then to use a radioisotope to deliver therapy. That's Theranostics. To deliver the right therapy to the right patient at the right time. And so our target, the key, if you like, is the somatostatin subclass 2, We've got a lot of peptides, linkers, and radionuclides. The first of them was indium-111 octreotide, uh, which uh, went by the trade name Octrea scan. And many of you will have had an Octrea scan on a gamma camera. More recently, uh, uh, in 2008, we introduced uh, gallium dotate into Australia. Uh, we call it gatate because we think it's the dangly bit in the key that matters, not the key ring. A lot of people call them dota scans, which really annoys me because it's like saying, here's the key ring. You know, that doesn't really matter. Uh, it's called also net spot in the United States. It's going to be marketed commercially. As I said, uh, this was very personal for me because my uh, cardiac stress nurse had it, and I, I uh, read about these uh, scans, and I wrote... You know, you know, as I said in the other meeting, that's what you did in the olden days. You wrote to someone, you know, sent a letter to Holland and said, oh, I've got this uh, nurse who's got this weird disease that I know you've got this imaging agent for and uh, you, I know you've been using this for treatment. Could you send me some? And they did. And we, we started doing it in the early 1990s of TRIA scan. And over the last 10 years, we've seen a dramatic evolution in this uh, scanning. And this is the same patient three days apart, one with the old scan, the Octrea scan, and one with a, uh, a Gatate scan, a do gallium dota octreotate scan. And unfortunately for the patient, but the scan didn't give the patient the, the multiple metastases, that they were always there. And the treatment predicated on the first scan would have been absolutely wrong. The one on the second scan was absolutely right. It's incredibly more accurate. It's faster. It's quicker, it's got lower radiation dose, and it's cheaper. So go figure. Why would you buy anything else? We can't get funding for it. The government doesn't think that superior diagnostic accuracy means anything. They won't pay for it. Nevertheless, we've effectively stopped doing indium octreotide uh, scans, except for patients who've had that for all of their uh, follow-up, and they usually uh, having them elsewhere as well. But very few patients are now having this, and the reason is that it changes management, and that's really important to to find the disease uh, extent that determines what the best patient for uh, uh, treatment for a given patient is. It's a winner in what I call the lumpology stakes. The more lumps you find the better you are able to plan whether surgery or, or, or um, radiotherapy or nuclear medicine therapy, whatever it is. Uh, changing management is really what's important. But maybe we need to go beyond lumpology and to understand how the tumour works, not just counting the lumps, but seeing where they uh, are functioning. And so this is a patient which represents the majority of patients with neuroendocrine tumours with a low-grade tumour. And you can see two different scans, one looking at somatostatin receptors, the GAT8 scan, one looking at glucose use. And if you were in the lumpology paradigm, you'd say FDG is a useless test in this patient because it hasn't seen any of their disease. But it's telling you that that disease is not very actively growing. It's got lots of receptors, but it's sitting there not doing very much. The other patient, on the right side is a high-grade tumour, and he has lots and lots of glucose use because the tumour is actively growing. But it's deviated so far from being a neuroendocrine cell that it's lost the receptor, so we don't see them at all. And 
so same disease, a neuroendocrine tumour, but two different imaging appearances. Uh, importantly, the lack of the somatostatin receptor on that theranostic paradigm means we can't treat that patient, we can't target them. And that's very important uh, for these patients. Because this one, tell us, is actively growing. And I say to Michael, what have you got in your uh, bucket of tricks to deal with this disease because I can't help this patient. And one of the great things about working in a place like Peter Mac is we have a great team of people who all work together to, again, use the imaging to deliver the best treatment to each individual patient. And so PRRT is delivering an isotope into the cell that gives off radiation and damages DNA. Uh, still not widely available in the United States, but it will become so. Uh, one of the criticisms that we had was that there was a lack of randomised controlled trials. This is a, uh, a trial called the NETA-1 trial, uh, where they compared the overall survival, and it's, these are early data and it'll be updated at this meeting, uh, but a significant improvement in survival in a group of patients uh, with uh, low-grade uh, tumours of the small intestine. I actually hate these Kaplan-Meier curves uh, as, as, as a person, as a doctor I understand them, uh, because every one of those little dots is an event. It's usually someone's death. And, and that doesn't tell the story of, of what uh, our treatments are about. Uh, they don't measure human suffering, the cost to individuals and families and the community of the morbidity that goes with this particular disease. We've been involved, uh, as I said, for 20 years in this. We've tried all sorts of things. Usually that means that none of them work perfectly. We've, we've adapted, we've learned as we've gone along. And uh, seeing some of those, those patients uh, and, and knowing other patients who've passed on, like, uh, like uh, Kate, uh, it's, uh, I wish I knew then what I know now because we're getting better all the time and we hope to keep getting better. It's important to recognise in everything I showed you that this was done at the end of the line. We did this for compassionate use. When patients had failed everything else, they had nothing else available to them. And most of the patients we've treated in the last 20 years would not have been able to get into a clinical trial because their performance status was too poor. They were too sick, their livers were too shot, the chemotherapy had dropped their blood counts to too low a level. That's changed as time's gone by because we've got better and better uh, 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 at selecting patients. One of the things that we did very early on and we're very proud of is pioneering peptide receptor chemoradionuclide therapy, combining radiation with the radiosensitising effects of chemotherapy. This was something that was very easy to get across the line here at Peter Mac because we were very early involved in combining external beam radiotherapy with chemotherapy, that's something that Michael in the lower GI uh, service was involved with. And so taking an agent that was already had some activity in neuroendocrine tumours and combining it with PRT wasn't a great psychological leap of faith for us and, and we think that it's made a big difference. We've never advertised our service, it's all been through word of mouth and we've had patients uh, uh, from all over Melbourne, all around rural uh, uh, Victoria, New South Wales and, and, and South Australia. But more than that, we've had patients from all over the world. Uh, we've got many patients, and Ben's going to talk from, from New Zealand, from really you can see from north to south in, in New Zealand, uh, in north to south of Australia. A couple from Perth, uh, Harvey uh, uh, Turner has taken a lot of the patients from there. And now there are, uh, I think, six um, peptide receptor radionuclide centres around Australia uh, delivering this therapy. But in the early days, we're the only ones. And we have patients coming from elsewhere in the world. The same principle applies. A key and a dangly bit. And the main dangly bit we use is lutetium with dota or triotate. We call it lutate. It's going to be called commercially probably lutathera. Uh, and uh, we started with Indium 111, uh, which is called intide or octria scan. And some people, uh, and we now use also in selected cases, yttrium dota or triotate, which we call whiteate, was also called octriothera. What does it all mean? They're particle throwers, uh, these isotopes. They toss stones and they uh, toss them out to different amounts of strength. The yttrium goes one cell. 
which is great if you're the cell that has lots of receptors on them, but not very effective if your cell doesn't have it. And that's actually the norm. Having a cluster bomb where the, th the stones are thrown in all directions and they hit uh, the neighbours. Uh, very few boys uh, injure themselves throwing stones, but if they're in a group and they're all throwing stones, they, they, they damage each other. Good thing about radionuclide therapy is that if you're outside the throwing zone of the isotope, you're completely immune from the effects of, of damage. So for yttrium, that's about a centimetre. For lutetium, it's about three millimetres total. We started, uh, as I said, in 1996, and it was really logistically difficult to do indium. You had to put people in, as, uh, as Simone said, uh, for a few days in a lead-lined room. Uh, it was very difficult. Uh, and in those years, it was a cottage industry. It was, we didn't do very many. But nevertheless, we helped a lot of patients control their symptoms, stop their disease progression. But we got very few uh, regressions of disease. And, uh, the industrial revolution was lutetium because the, there was much more of this crossfire effect and patients responded much better. And then we've gone to what I like to think of as the enlightenment to using highly personalised uh, therapy. One of the, the arguments that I got very early on was, of course you're getting good results because you're selecting the good players, the pa patients who have the receptors, they're all the low-grade ones. But in fact, we hadn't. We'd only chosen primarily patients who'd been progressing, whose disease was, was accelerating and they were having uh, significant symptoms. And in fact, a third of them had FDG. That characteristic I told you about was an aggressive feature of the tumours, that they were using more glucose. That means they're growing. And a good proportion of them were the G2, the more aggressive tumours. And we got some pretty spectacular results. This is a, uh, a hepatobiliary surgeon, <laughs> by coincidence, 76-year-old guy, who would not have been eligible for most clinical trials because his liver was completely shot, uh, packed with tumour in 2009, and as you can see, dramatic response. And he's still alive in his 80s. And he, he said to me, oh, well, I think I must have had one of those low-grade tumours. Maybe the biopsy was wrong. <laughs> Go figure. But he'd tried everything. He'd had somatostatin analogues, he'd had chemotherapy, and they'd all sort of worked a little bit, but not for very long. And with PRRT, his chromogranin levels came right down and they stayed down and they have remained down for a long time. When patients have highly functional tumours, uh, we can turn off their hormone secretion. This patient went from being in ICU uh, to being uh, walking around out around the street. The scan looks better, but more importantly than that, the patient's alive and out of intensive care uh, and off all medications. One of the people on the video, uh, Sandra, uh, told you she came in a wheelchair with paraparesis, 2008. And over the course of giving her serial treatments when her chromogranin started to rise again, her tumours got better and better. Uh, over the years, and she's, as you saw on the video, she's still alive. We looked at, and again, I hate this, this curve, but it tells us something important. With a median follow-up of 62 months, more than half of our patients are still alive with this disease. That's, that's really important. And when we compare it to a group of patients who don't have access to PRRT in France, who are otherwise the same, somatostatin receptor positive, so a positive Octrea scan and a positive FDG scan, their survival, 19 months, over, median overall survival. We've looked at our own survival in that group with exclusively FDG avid disease as well as somatostatin. Same group, median progression-free survival, four years uh, overall survival, uh, getting up towards uh, five years. Very high response rates, shrinkage of tumour, one, only one patient progressing. And that patient progressed with exclusively FDG avid disease, which in retrospect, we'd missed a deposit that had lack of the, the target uh, that we, uh, we go for. How does it compare to the conventional therapies? Uh, Everolimus is an approved drug because of a randomised controlled trial. Uh, Snitinib also, their progression-free survival is 11 months. Now, we were criticised because we have retrospective data. 
Um, but in fact, the medical oncology community has rapidly embraced CAPTEM on the basis of a 30 patient study showing a high response rate but a median progression free survival of 18 months. But we're criticised because we don't have evidence of the efficacy of PRRT. The, the advantage for uh, oncologists is that CAPTEM was already widely used in other uh, areas. We've been told, don't treat patients with high-grade tumours. That's, that's dangerous. You're, you're denying them access to chemotherapy. This is a patient with a high-grade neuroendocrine, should be neck neuroendocrine carcinoma, or we're starting to think of these now as well-differentiated uh, uh, neuroendocrine carcinomas. That's another patient on the video. That's his baseline uh, GATAID scan and the post-PRT. Pretty impressive. But he'd had chemotherapy in March 2013, and he'd progressed on one of the most aggressive chemotherapy regimens uh, that we have. And most importantly, after PRT, that bad signal has gone away. The FDG has gone away. And he's still alive. He was talking on the video. So why don't we use it up front? Well, we are. We've started to move it further uh, earlier. This is a, a GP, uh, a doctor herself, uh, who has extensive tumour infiltrating the veins that lead from the pancreas into her liver and down uh, what's called the superior mesenteric vein. Uh, we treat her up front. Three cycles of treatment. She went home to France uh, to holiday because she felt so well. So we've, we've decided that, that perhaps we need to think more about this pattern of disease. And as tumours go from low grade to high grade, the likelihood of the, the somatostatin being there diminishes, but it doesn't go away entirely. Uh, glucose, on the other hand, increases, grade goes higher. But sometimes there's a group of patients down the low end that are also using glucose. It may be the biopsy's got it wrong. Most people think the green area is the go zone for PRRT, but they're not necessarily the ones who benefit most because the tumour's not necessarily growing. Obviously, we can't treat the stop sign uh, up there because they don't have the target. They don't have the somatostatin receptor. We actually think the best fun is, is going through the amber light. Uh, like, uh, it's legal. You're allowed to do it. <laughs> and you don't get stopped. Uh, the, the, the higher grade tumours are using glucose that still have the receptor on the surface are the ones that are most benefiting from the treatment, the most amenable to treatment, but also the most likely to respond because it's actively dividing cells that are most sensitive to radiation. That's why we give radiation to cancer patients because the cells are growing. And that creates a sort of a, a disconnect in most people's mind. The target is the somatostatin receptor. So why do we still have the somatostatin receptor expressing cells after treatment when the FTG is gone? It's because we've killed a subpopulation of actively growing cells. We've left the more benign, the more indolent ones. And many of our patients go on for years and years and years with still an abnormal octreotate scan. And we don't treat them because they're not growing. We've, we've turned them back into a chronic disease from being a growing disease. One of the things that Grace Kong, Grace is here, stand up and say hello. She's one of, one of the stars of my team, looked at um, uh, this. Uh, when, when we looked at the outcomes, we found that big tumours didn't work so well. And so we started to combine a really penetrating, powerful rock-throwing uh, isotope yttrium uh, sequentially with lutetium. If we look at a rim of collateral damage around your tumour, lutetium doesn't make much difference. There's uh, less than 10% of the radiation outside the deposit if it's only one centimetre, less than 2% if it's five centimetres. But if we use lutetium in the same uh, scenario, for the small lesions, it's a really bad deal. Uh, uh, more than 60% of the radiation is outside the deposit. Uh, and even with big ones, still about 20, 25% is outside. But the very heavy isotopes make a big difference to the, uh, the radiation. And if you can deliver more radiation into a tumour, you're more likely to kill it. And so this is a patient with a hugely bulky tumour. You can see the tumour shrinking away. 
and Grace again did very nice study showing that in this group of the worst prognosis patients we had, uh, excellent survival, good tumour shrinkage by either CT or measuring it on, on the PET scan. The scans are important, but how do we judge success? As I said, for me, it's always been personal. A 13-year-old girl with androgenizing gastronoma, that's a medical term, she was hairy. Horrible for a young girl uh, going off to her formal. Uh, uh, six months later, she'd lost her hair, she, uh, hairy face, grown her hair back on her head, uh, and she went there looking gorgeous. A 25-year-old guy who was incapacitated by bleeding ulcers who, 18 months later, established a, a new business. A 44-year-old uh, man who gained, uh, went from, from 60 kilograms as a, as a two-metre man, uh, gained his weight, felt so well that he decided to, to start a family, and he did have two, uh, two children. Uh, another patient who we couldn't measure her hormones, but she was completely decompensated, uh, sitting in bed, defecating. She was just completely uh, off the planet. Uh, she was, within three years, out in the community uh, fully functioning. An actress who won an award uh, after being treated, feeling the best she had in seven years. Another patient uh, who became a great friend of mine because uh, I looked after him for, for 12 years. I went to his funeral, and not many doctors go to the patients' funeral, funerals. It's the ultimate uh, admission of failure, I guess, for a, for a doctor. But I went there and it really was enlightening to me because he kept a photo diary of his life. And most of the photo diaries were from the moment of diagnosis until his death. And during that time, he'd been the coach of his, his grandsons who hadn't even been born uh, when, uh, I still choke up about this, <laughs> um, uh, who he saw grow up and, and he coached the football team to a grand final win at, at um, Auskick and a cardiologist who rode behind the Tour de France who's here today. Uh, there he scans, and they're impressive, but to me that's more important that, that he uh, was able to, to go on living a life that's full of quality and, and full of meaning. And this can go on. We don't necessarily win all the battles, but we can... Um, uh, well, we can't win the war always, but we can win little battles by treating patients when they need to, when they recruit S. This is a patient with, again, a, a relatively high-grade tumour, failed chemotherapy, great response, recruit S, gave him a number of treatments. And during that time, he travelled a lot. Uh, he went to San Susi without care. He, he would send me emails of his travel pics and he went on a safari in Botswana. He died uh, uh, earlier this year, but he'd had a great life. Another of my patients said, I came to you when I was facing the Grand Canyon, the, uh, the abyss. I could go over the edge or I could take the donkey trail. And it's not always comfortable, but I'll take the donkey trail any time. Uh, and uh, he's certainly still taking the donkey trail. So I really want to thank particularly the Unicorn Foundation and, and my fantastic team at Peter Mac and, and all of you who've made this possible by volunteering your time and, and your, your, your passions to this disease. And happy the man, happy alone who can talk, call today his own, who's secure within can say tomorrow do your worst for I've lived today. Thanks very much. <laughs>